Good morning, and welcome to the FDA McKenna hearing. I'm Mike Kaczynski, and I will be helping run today's uh, event. Uh, this is day three. However, uh, we are going to start the meeting at around 8.30 today. Uh, so I know we were originally scheduled for 8, but uh, we have uh, had to adjust the time clock to 8.30 to make sure that all of our members and everybody else uh, is with us. So that being said, uh, sit back and uh, listen to some music for a few minutes, and we will get started hopefully promptly at 8.30. Thank you.
This is a live virtual meeting, so we may at any one time run into either technical issue or delay due to uh, for for any reason. So that being said, I want to make sure that we get uh, this show on the road, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Celia Witten. Dr. Witten, are you ready? Yes. Uh, good morning. Take it away. Yeah. Good morning. Um, today, uh, my name is Celia Witten. I'm the presiding officer for this hearing. Today, we'll have presentations, closing statements by Cedar and Covis, followed by the advisory committee discussion and voting on the questions. I now call to order day three of the October 17th through 19th, 2022 hearing conducted with the Obstetrics, Reproductive, and Urologic Drugs Advisory Committee. Dr. Moon He Choi is a designated federal officer for this hearing, and we'll begin with a roll call. Good morning. My name is Moon Hee Choi. I am the acting designee of the federal, federal officer for this hearing. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and your affiliation. Dr. Aluko? Uh, Dr. Dr. Aluko is, uh, is going to be a little late, uh, is in surgery. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Eisenberg? Good morning, Esther Eisenberg. I'm a uh, an OBGYN medical officer at the uh, uh, National Institute of uh, Child Health and Human Development, NICHD. Thank you, Dr. Gaff. I'm sorry, Dr. Fox. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Fox. I'm the industry representative. I'm an OBGYN currently working in late-stage clinical research at Merck. Thank you. Dr. Gass? Hello, I'm Marjorie Gass, OBGYN, clinical professor emeritus. Let's see, I don't know if my camera's on. Um, clinical professor emeritus, University of Cincinnati, and past executive director of the North American Menopause Society. Thank you. Dr. Lindsay? Good morning. I'm Michael Lindsay, also an OBGYN, Director of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Emory University. Thank you. Dr. Munn? Hey, I'm Mary Munn. I'm Maternal Fetal Medicine and Chairman at the University of South Alabama. Thank you. Dr. Shield? Hi, I'm Christine Shields. I'm a uh, retired nurse practitioner of a doctor in public health from UNC. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Um, Coley? Hi, Aaron Coy, um, Department Chair, uh, Professor of OBGYN at uh, or uh, Oregon Health and Science University. Thank you. Dr. Ellenberg? Hi, I'm Susan Ellenberg. I'm Professor Emerita of Biostatistics, Medical Ethics, and Health Policy 
at the Crowman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Ms. Ellis? Hi, I'm Annie Ellis. I am serving as patient representative. I have a personal history of preterm labor, and it is also in my family. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harper? Hi, I'm Lori Harper. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist at the University of Texas at Austin Bell Medical School. Thank you. Dr. Henderson? Hi, maternal fetal medicine at Garden OBGYN in New York. Ma'am, can you reintroduce yourself, Cassandra? You have to hold your mic. Okay. So, okay. Hi, Cassandra Henderson. I'm a maternal fetal medicine at Garden OBGYN, a consultant in New York. Thank you, Dr. Hudak. Good morning. I'm Mark Hudak. I'm a neonatologist and chair and professor of pediatrics at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. Thank you, Dr. Kaimo. Hi, Angelie Kaimo, and I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist, and I'm professor and vice chair of clinical operations at the University of South Florida Department of OBGYN. Thank you. Dr. McAdams DeMarco. Good morning. I'm Dr. Mara McAdams DeMarco. I'm an associate professor and epidemiologist at the NYU Grissom School of Medicine with appointments in the Department of Surgery and Population Health. I also serve as the associate vice chair for research in the Department of Surgery. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Overton. Good morning, Sarah Obichan from the University of South Florida Maternal Fetal Medicine Division Director. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now proceed with the closing statement by the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. I ask that the speaker please introduce herself before you speak. Good morning. I'm Dr. Peter Stein, Director of the Office of New Drugs, CEDAR. Uh, my role today is to summarize our assessment and provide the committee our basis for recommendation to withdraw McKenna from the market. I know you are now fully familiar with the facts, so I will review the situation only briefly. Trial 002, the MEES trial, was completed in the early 2000s. It had been initiated to follow up on a meta-analysis of several very small trials from the 1970s and 80s in a range of populations and at a range of doses. Trial 002 had limitations. The randomization was two to one, which meant that the placebo group was relatively small. And a single site contributed more than a quarter of the participants. I'll come back to some of these limitations in a few minutes. The results of trial 02 were unquestionably promising with a strong p-value for the reduction in events of preterm birth of gestational age under 37 weeks. I would add that this study did not show evidence of benefit on the most important endpoint, improved neonatal outcome. It's important to remind you that only the week 37 gestational age endpoint had a persuasive p-value. The p-values of gestational ages less than 32 and less than 35 weeks were not strong or persuasive and would not have supported approval based upon a single trial. I want to discuss this point a bit further. For a single adequate and well-controlled trial to support approval, we usually consider that it has to be statistically very persuasive, generally as persuasive as having two independent, positive, adequate, and well-controlled trials. This is not, however, by any means a rigid threshold. It can be modified based upon the seriousness of the disease and the unmet need. That's one of the ways we can apply regulatory flexibility, accepting more uncertainty regarding the statistical robustness of the findings. Accelerated approval is another form of regulatory flexibility, and it is one that FDA applied to McKenna. Accelerated approval involves accepting the uncertainty of the ability of the surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoint to predict the desired clinical benefit. Here, the ability of the drug's effect on gestational age less than 37 weeks to predict improved neonatal outcomes. I mention regulatory flexibility here in part because of COVIS's focus on the concept and to highlight that FDA is willing to and has employed this flexibility, including with respect to Makina itself. So as you are aware, on the basis of improved preterm birth rate less than 37 weeks, 
an endpoint we concluded was reasonably likely to predict neonatal benefit, McKenna received accelerated approval. With accelerated approval, a post-approval study to verify benefit was required. We've already heard the outcome of that study, the prolonged trial, or trial 003, a study that was nearly four times the size of trial 002, and was a well-designed and executed trial. I want to underline most importantly that this study found no evidence of effectiveness on the pre-specified co-primary endpoints of neonatal composite index or events of preterm birth under 35 weeks in the overall study population, and no effect on the gestational age less than 37 week endpoint either. So not confirming the gestational age endpoint upon which the drug was given accelerated approval. A trial must be first and foremost evaluated based upon its primary study hypothesis or hypotheses. Trial 003 was, and that means it was a fully negative trial, full stop. After that, all one is left with is speculation and post hoc data dredging and exploration. At this point, we are searching for hypothesis to inform further studies clearly a valuable exercise, but we are no longer seeking evidence of effectiveness from that trial, and we cannot rely on post hoc analysis to turn a decisively negative study into a positive one. With the negative result of trial 003, you've heard that the sponsor has raised concerns about the study, and we agree that understanding why a trial has failed is important. It helps in the design of the next study, but it cannot be the basis for concluding that a drug is effective. Now, trial 003 was a multinational trial, as are many, if not most, clinical, large clinical trials. The trial included women outside of the U.S., especially from sites in Ukraine and Russia. COBUS has suggested that perhaps women from these countries were not properly assessed with regard to their qualifying pregnancy. We've already addressed this point. Birth weights of the qualifying preterm birth in babies born to mothers in Russia and Ukraine were not greater than birth weights of the qualifying pregnancy in the U.S. In other words, there is no reason to believe that these women did not, in fact, have a prior preterm birth. We've heard concerns about differences in clinical care in these countries, yet no such differences were suggested that would alter the response to the drug. And we've certainly not heard any reason that preterm birth in Ukraine and Russia is somehow a different disorder than in the U.S., and therefore might be less susceptible to response to drug. In fact, preterm birth is a global problem, and there is no evidence that the pathogenesis of the disorder differs across regions. That's why including patients from these countries was reasonable and planned for by the sponsor from the start of the trial. The women in Ukraine and Russia did have a relatively low rate of preterm birth than did the U.S. patients, but the rates were clearly elevated from the women in these countries. Around 20% had a preterm birth. This is relative to a background rate of about 8 to 9% and similar to the reported U.S. rate with a prior preterm birth of about 21 to 22%. I remind you that we did not find any risk factors, including race, that meaningfully modified the response to McKenna in trial 002 on its primary endpoint. In other words, there were no effect modifiers, factors that raise or lower the extent of a drug's response. So merely because these women in UK and in Russia from trial 03 may have had fewer risk factors is not a basis to dismiss the results from these women. And you really can't have it both ways. Concluding that the drug worked in trial 02 regardless of the presence or absence of a risk factor, as COBUS showed in their slide, and then concluding that because women did not have a particular risk factor, they were not able to respond to the drug in trial 003. These women had, preterm, had a preterm birth rate that was elevated and could certainly have had an improvement in their rate of preterm birth with the study drug, but they did not. We noted that the U.S. subgroup in trial 003 was approximately equal in size to the size of trial 002 and showed no effect of McKenna. But again, the sponsor points to differences in risk factors among these women versus in trial 002, despite the fact that they did not find that risk factors were effect modifiers. As I've already noted, trial 003, a trial nearly four times the size of trial 002, was a fully negative study. That's the most robust, important result. It's, conclusion, it's a conclusion based upon what was pre-specified and has appropriate statistical control. But I'd like to discuss with you the subgroup observations 
As we noted in our presentation, we did look at the pre-specified subgroups and saw no differences in response. There was no effective drug seen in any subgroup. We then did some further analysis looking at additional risk factors and combinations of risk factors. Now, whether you look at individuals with one or more or two or more or three or more of the known risk factors, no response differences were seen. No effectiveness was seen in any such subgroup across levels of risk factors. The sponsors also done some initial, additional post hoc exploratory analysis from trial 03, omitting most of the patients and doing a variety of cuts, starting with a subset of U.S. patients and, as I noted on Monday, then finding subsets of subsets and found some nominally significant findings. Yet these same findings were generally not seen in trial 02, nor were these findings observed when you expand the population to include women outside of the U.S. In other words, these are not robust, reliable observations. Perhaps interesting hypothesis generating, but not reliable evidence. To remind you, these were not pre-specified, not controlled for multiplicity, not consistent between trials, and not consistent in U.S. versus ex-U.S. women. In other words, not evidence upon which to base regulatory decisions, such as changing the indication, nor, I would suggest, guide clinical practice decisions. Just as an example, COVID showed some analyses suggesting that in their subset of subsets in trial 002 and 03, they could show that patients may have gained about a week in the duration of gestation. The trial 02 analysis excluded about two-thirds of the patients from that trial, and the trial 03 analyses excluded 95% of the patients from that study. Hardly robust. If we were looking at this data in a new drug application and discussing whether or not there was substantial evidence of effectiveness, I can say that Cedar's answer would be no. But I will leave you to consider your answer to this. And based on our discussion yesterday, it would seem that Cobus and Cedar agree on the limited hypothesis-generating nature of this evidence. And you heard from Cobus yesterday some very detailed explanations of why the analysis might have been inconsistent across trials or inconsistent in U.S. versus ex-U.S. women. Again, such post hoc speculation is helpful in raising hypotheses to test but should worry us if we are using such speculation as the basis for a regulatory decision. So we're left with a positive trial 002 and the much larger trial 003, which was fully and completely negative on the pre-specified endpoints. In asking why this might be, I'd like to have us consider some of the limitations of trial 002. In this regard, the much higher than anticipated preterm birth rate in the placebo group is worth some discussion. Now, certainly we have to take the results from trial 002 at face value and generally should avoid cross-study comparisons. Indeed, that's what CEDAR did in the first place in our assessments that led to the approval of Makina. But in the context of the fully negative larger trial 003, this finding does need to be reconsidered. This rate seen in the placebo group of 55% for preterm birth events less than 37 weeks was discussed at prior ACs. This rate is higher than seen in other trials or reported in epidemiologic observations. Indeed, this rate was raised in the publication of the Mies trial. In our presentation, we noted results from a report from Georgia at a time unlikely to be impacted by HPC showing a 37% rate of recurrent preterm birth less than 37 weeks, which is exactly the rate seen in the McKenna treatment group. I note that the sponsor also reported no epidemiologic evidence or any other evidence showing a similar placebo group rate from any trial. Then we looked at other data bearing on the question of McKenna effectiveness. Clearly, there was a robust discussion over the past two days of the use and limitations of results from real-world evidence, observational analyses, and other randomized clinical trials. We noted in our presentations that real-world observational studies have limitations. They can be confounded, and they reflect the limitations of how a drug is actually used in practice. Yet, we found five studies that did have a reasonable design and found no evidence of HPC's or McKenna's effectiveness. From one of the studies we discussed, the BASTIC study, we provided you the primary pre-specified study objective, which was to compare the preterm birth rate to, prior to and after the introduction of McKenna 
and it showed no difference. And COBUS discussed a subset analysis. But once again, we need to focus on the pre-specified analyses. Post hoc analyses support hypothesis and, not, and do not strongly contribute to evidence of effectiveness. Then we looked at a wide range of other randomized clinical trials. And as we and COBUS agree, these are largely not in the indicated population, so don't directly bear on the efficacy in this population. But they can provide information about the pharmacologic action of the drug in related conditions of increased risk of preterm birth. The absence of response outside the indicated population is not alone strong evidence that Makina is not effective in the indicated population. But certainly, with multiple trials, seeing some suggestive an effect would have been reassuring, yet none was seen. Now, turning to EPIC, as we pointed out in the set of studies with, with singleton pregnancies, including studies outside the indicated population and a, studies, and a study with a higher dose, there was no statistically significant effect, even as the upper bound was just above one. However, after omitting trial over O2 from the analysis, the upper bound is well above one. Now, I want to turn to discussing the safety of the drug and how that factors into our recommendation. We agreed that the safety profile of McKenna has not substantially changed. There are serious risks that are described in the labeling. Now, COBUS presented information on reports of spontaneous events for McKenna, and I noted that there were 36 spontaneous reported events of venous thromboembolism. Putting aside that we'd expect underreporting, especially of events that are labeled, I would remind you that such events, even if very infrequent, are not minor and can be life-threatening or even fatal. I don't say this to raise red flags regarding the safety of McKenna, but only to say that for a woman to be exposed to any risk in connection with the labeled use of an approved product, and especially a serious risk, there must be evidence of benefit that outweighs those risks. So McKenna has established risks and uncertainties for other risks. We discussed the Murphy study that reported increased cancer risk in children exposed in utero to HPC. This study had limitations. We and COVIS agree on this, but neither did we dismiss this risk. And it does raise the concern that long-term safety in the children of women treated with McKenna is not fully understood. We cannot merely dismiss this, especially since evidence of benefit is lacking. As I conclude, <coughs> Excuse me. As I concluded on Monday, absent evidence of effectiveness, we are only left with risk. <clears throat> the benefit-risk balance for McKenna is not favorable and does not support leaving the drug on the market. Now, COBUS has argued that we should nonetheless leave the drug on the market, and they assert that they can rapidly complete another study. I remind you that it took 10 years to complete trial 003 that recruited, recruited 391 women in the U.S. with McKenna on the market. Now, they want to do another study with more U.S. patients than in trial 003 and claim it could be done in four to six years. I doubt it. I ran studies when I was in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years, and the best predictor of future recruitment is past performance. I recognize that COVIS has cited surveys that were conducted with questions that I do not think provide substantive insight into likely study feasibility. Again, I think to expect rapid recruitment now, when that was not in evidence before, seems fanciful. And let's be clear, the size of the study is by no means resolved. To demonstrate that there is evidence sufficient to support the likelihood of neonatal benefit, a much larger trial may well be needed. Ten plus years is likely, assuming it will be faster is not a good bet. And of course, the outcome is uncertain. Our experience with testing post hoc hypotheses from negative trials is that more often than not, the subsequent trial is also negative. But I also want to be very clear. Our recommendation to withdraw the drug from the market is not based upon how long it will take to complete another trial. It is about the evidence in front of us today. A smaller trial that was promising and a fully negative, much larger, well-designed and conducted study and results from real-world evidence observational studies of HPC or McKenna and other randomized clinical trials, and also supporting the conclusion from trial 003 that McKenna has not been shown to be effective. We are recommending withdrawal because two legal grounds for withdrawal are clearly met. The confirmatory trial 
failed to verify clinical benefit, and other evidence demonstrates that the drug is not shown to be effective for its approved indication. After determining that two independent legal grounds for withdrawal are satisfied, we concluded that the drug should be withdrawn because the benefit-risk balance is unfavorable. Not to do so here would upend the intention behind the accelerated approval pathway, one that pairs earlier access for promising treatments with withdrawal if the drug does not pan out. We heard from many clinicians and patients over the past days, and we heard them very clearly. They want an effective drug on the market and can accept some uncertainty. So do we, and so can we if the data and the science support it. But the current data in front of us does not leave us with some uncertainty. It leaves us with a lot of uncertainty. When we approved McCain, we accepted some uncertainty, applying regulatory flexibility, as I've noted. That's not where we are now. We do not have evidence that McCain is effective. The regulatory flexibility that COVA suggests we employ here is not appropriate. Setting the precedent that merely having a reasonable hypothesis of benefit absent evidence is sufficient to maintain a drug's approval would be very troubling. Based on what we know today, we cannot support leaving the drug not shown to be effective and with known risks on the market. Now, I want to clear up a few points raised regarding precedence. Cobus mentioned mitodrin, noting that it was approved under accelerated approval and despite negative confirmatory trials, was not pulled from the market. What COVIS did not tell you is that the confirmatory trials did see improvement in standing blood pressure, the endpoint that supported accelerated approval. In other words, the surrogate endpoint that supported the accelerated approval was still observed in the confirmatory trials, certainly not the case for McKenna. They also pointed to the cancer drug ERISA and noted that labeling was modified with a narrowed indication. If the indication was narrowed to patients already on the drug who had an objective response to this drug, and let me remind you that shrinkage of a tumor or survival long beyond expected survival for a cancer are reasonably robust indicators of response to that drug. That same information is by no means available to support a labeling change for Makina. Finally, ERISA was subsequently withdrawn from the market, and when a new trial following up on reasonable hypotheses of a subset of high responders identified and demonstrated effectiveness in this responder population, the drug was then approved and returned to the market with an indication focused on this population, and now with a favorable benefit-risk balance. So I would ask that you focus on the information in front of you in your discussion and vote. And be careful about basing your recommendations for our regulatory action on post hoc, non specified, and non robust analyses. You heard from some practitioners that, to, that no treatment is the worst outcome. We disagree. It is clearly worse to provide a drug requiring weekly injections exposing patients to serious risks, both established and uncertainties, without evidence of benefit. Hope is a reason to keep looking for options that are effective, whether we find them here or elsewhere. Hope is not a reason to take a drug that is not shown to be effective or keep it on the market. I'd add that, I'd add that as we at FDA make decisions based on data and science, so do many practitioners. Now, several speakers pointed to the marked decline in the use of McCain over the past several years and suggested that this reflected our assessments and the AC discussion back in 2019. Well, I'd like to raise another possibility that clinicians have actually looked at the evidence and are not convinced that McCain is effective and that using this drug is not in their patient's best interest. It is time that we withdraw McCain from the market. To be clear, this is not an easy decision for anyone, including those on the CEDAR team. We've heard COVIS's arguments. We've heard from the 2019 Advisory Committee meeting, from healthcare providers, the input from patient organizations, and from patients themselves. But taking all of the information into account, the evidence that we have today, the science supports withdrawing the drug. That's what we believe is in the best interest of patients or we stand ready to work with drug developers to find therapies for this serious condition. So we did think this was a promising treatment, but unfortunately, we no longer do. I want to thank the advisory committee members for their time and efforts, and also the sponsor for engaging in a very important discussion, and of course, the many patients and practitioners who are looking for answers. I hope that further studies of McKenna and other potential treatments will be successful. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Stein. <clears throat> we'll now proceed with the closing statement by COVIS, and following that, we'll take a 15-minute break. I ask that the speaker please introduce yourself before you speak. Uh, good morning. Um, Mike, may we have slide share, please? Good morning. I'm Raghav Chari, Chief Innovation Officer at Covis Pharma. I will conclude by summarizing our proposed path forward and by sharing our position on the questions posed to this committee. Covis is committed to executing a robust plan to confirm the clinical benefit of Makina and to address the outstanding questions raised by CEDAR, while at the same time continuing to meet the critical needs of a higher risk group of patients. This includes our willingness to focus labeling on the high-risk target patient population. A randomized control trial to confirm Makina's effect on an intermediate clinical endpoint. And an observational study to validate the benefit of prolonging gestational age or neonatal morbidity and mortality with 17P treatment. This is a practical approach that will preserve access by enabling the treating physician to make an individualized benefit-risk determination in, cons in consultation with their patients. Our post hoc analyses have identified a higher risk patient population. When looking at the results in women with multiple risk factors, including a spontaneous preterm birth before week 35 and one or more additional risk factors, we see a consistent benefit with Makina in both the MEES and prolonged trials. I note that CEDAR has just acknowledged that MEES is a positive clinical trial and not as suggested yesterday a proof of concept. As we discussed yesterday, Prolong is a failed study conducted in a population in which it was not possible to confirm the MEES results. Therefore, Prolong is not a definitive negative study and does not negate MEES. I'd like to acknowledge the comments we heard yesterday and reiterate that we're not proposing that race biologically differentiates patients. At the same time, it is well documented that preterm birth disproportionately impacts women who are black and other minorities in the United States. These and other social determinants of risk are factors in defining the higher risk population where Makina is most likely to be effective. We're proposing to conduct a third randomized control trial in this higher risk population. As we talked about yesterday, our analyses indicate that a sample size of 400 patients Randomized in a two-to-one ratio between McKenna and placebo would be sufficient to confirm benefit. The primary endpoint would evaluate the mean increase in time from randomization to birth capped at 35 weeks for McKenna-treated patients compared with placebo. We estimate that the proposed trial can be completed in four to six years. Yesterday, we heard the questions from the panel about the time it would take to complete a third randomized control trial. We are prepared to work collaboratively with CEDAR to finalize and launch the study as expeditiously as possible. Based on our feasibility assessments, we are confident that we can meet our enrollment targets for this trial. We've conducted multiple surveys of physicians, patients, and investigators to evaluate the willingness to participate in another trial. These surveys support that providers will be more likely to refer patients to a trial with an approved product compared to a trial of a withdrawn product. Specifically for the prevention of recur recurrent preterm birth, 80% of providers reported that they would consider recommending a pregnant patient enroll in a placebo-controlled study when the product is FDA approved. In contrast, only 15% would consider referring patients if the product had its marketing authorization for this indication withdrawn. This research suggests that enrolling a clinical trial following withdrawal is likely to face more significant challenges than if the product were to remain on the market. Since Prolong was published three years ago, we estimate that the use of Makina and its generics has dropped approximately 45% in the United States, reflecting a greater clinical equipoise than at the time when Prolong was being enrolled. It is for these reasons that we're confident a third randomized clinical trial can be enrolled in the United States with the product still on market. However, given the concerns regarding the feasibility of conducting such a trial, we would also commit to study conduct criteria and to voluntarily withdrawing Makina if these criteria are not achieved. 
These checkpoints would come during an interim efficacy analysis for futility, at a 24-month check on enrollment projections, and based on the final outcome of the study. In all cases, if any of these indicate that pre-specified criteria cannot be achieved or have not been achieved, we will work with the FDA to withdraw the product from the market. As a final step in our path forward, we are open to conducting an observational study. The goal of this study would be to establish the relationship between gestational age and neonatal outcomes in treated versus untreated patients to validate the benefit of weeks gained on 17P. The results of such a study would confirm or refute that the benefits of pharmacological prolongation of gestation can be inferred from the known associations of gestational age with neonatal health outcomes. Next, I'd like to take a moment to share our position to the questions posed to this committee. First, do the findings from trial 003 prolong verify the clinical benefit of Makina on neonatal morbidity and mortality from complications of preterm birth? We have stipulated that the findings from Prolong do not verify the clinical benefit of Makina on neonatal morbidity and mortality in the studied population. However, when a confirmatory trial fails to provide additional confirmation of clinical benefit, that is the beginning and not the end of the analysis. Next, you will be asked to discuss and vote on whether the available evidence demonstrate that Makina is effective for its approved indication of reducing the risk of preterm birth in women with a singleton pregnancy who have had a history of singleton spontaneous preterm birth. We stand by the significant outcomes observed in the MEES trial. The MEES trial demonstrated statistically significant reductions in preterm birth with Makina across all pre-specified endpoints in all key subgroups. But we recognize the questions and concerns that were raised by the prolonged trial. In our view, and as described yesterday, the prolonged trial enrolled a lower risk population compared with MEES. Therefore, prolonged was not capable of confirming the benefits of Makina in a population of patients similar to those enrolled in the MEES trial. Based on extensive post hoc exploratory analyses, we have identified a higher risk target population of women who achieved a consistent benefit with Makina in both the MEES and prolonged trials. Therefore, we are asking to work with the agency to align the labeling for Makina with this higher risk subset of patients. This could include narrowing the indication, expanding the limitations of use, modifying the clinical studies section of the labeling, or other solutions such as a Dear Healthcare Provider letter. We will also continue to not promote Makina our commercial efforts will focus exclusively on maintaining patient access. While CEDAR has challenged the results of the prolonged trial, specifically with respect to the benefits in a subgroup of patients, in a target population of higher risk patients, we do see a consistent benefit with Makina. Here we see the overall results for the continuous endpoint of time from randomization to delivery capped at 35 weeks for the proposed high risk target population for both prolonged U.S. and MEES. For prolonged U.S., the estimate is 1.86 weeks, or about 13 days, and for MEES, the estimate is 1.33 weeks, or about nine days. I'd like to take a moment to reconcile these data with the conclusions pre presented by CEDAR. We acknowledge that the prolonged trial did not show a benefit on the categorical endpoints of preterm birth less than 35 weeks or less than 37 weeks which were in the endpoints presented by CEDAR in their subgroup analysis. The challenge with these categorical endpoints is that women who receive 17P and achieve a meaningful increase in gestational age relative to placebo, for example, from 30 to 32 weeks, would not be captured. Our analysis avoids that problem by using a more sensitive outcome measure that should detect clinically meaningful increases in gestational age in all periods of pregnancy through 35 weeks of gestation. I'd like to acknowledge the question yesterday about the interpretation of the gestational age data. The weeks gained seen in this analysis correspond to the true increase in gestational age at delivery. This is because our analysis controlled for gestational age at randomization. We also see a consistent effect in the target patient population for the dichotomous endpoints of preterm birth less than 37, less than 35, 
in less than 32 weeks. Also note the confidence intervals for the less than 35 and less than 32 weeks for the me subgroup, which speak to the strength of the efficacy signal seen in this population. The available evidence demonstrates that Makina remains effective for a higher risk subset of patients. Finally, CEDAR has presented a forest plot of studies and suggested that these are representative of Makina's efficacy. I'd like to reinforce that aside from MIS and Prolong, the studies shown in this figure are not relevant to our discussions. For reasons Dr. Green and I covered during this hearing, the three observational studies have significant flaws and limitations. Similarly, the list of RCTs in women outside of Makina's labeled indications, such as those with twins or triplets, are not relevant to this proceeding. To summarize our position on the second question, the MEES trial remains substantial evidence of Makina's efficacy. Additionally, post hoc analyses of prolonged U.S. support that Makina is effective in a higher risk subset of patients at greatest risk of preterm birth. Therefore, we're proposing to limit the use of Makina to patients who are at higher risk and need access to this therapy while we execute on our path to address the outstanding questions. Next, the committee will be asked whether Makina should remain on the market, and importantly, whether or not FDA should allow Makina to remain on the market while an appropriate confirmatory study is designed and conducted. While Prolong was unable to confirm the benefits observed in MEES, it did not reveal any unexpected or new safety concerns. It did reaffirm Makina's overall favorable safety profile. These are the integrated safety data from the MEES and Prolong trials, which reflect a favorable safety profile comparable to placebo maternal and fetal risks. Additionally, CEDAR has brought up VTEs. The same integrated safety data show an incidence of 0.07% in Makina versus 0.1% in placebo. These data were provided on page 70 in our briefing book. So the question remains, what now? CEDAR agrees that the standard for withdrawal of accelerated approval is permissive. They acknowledge, quote, CEDAR possesses various regulatory options when a confirmatory trial fails to verify clinical benefit. Accordingly, FDA has the authority to allow Makina to remain on the market while another trial is conducted. We urge this committee to recommend that Makina remain on the market for at least this subset of higher risk patients while we collect additional evidence to confirm its benefit. Our proposed path forward will confirm the benefit of Makina in the target population and address the remaining outstanding questions raised by CEDA while at the same time continuing to meet the critical needs of patients at a higher risk of preterm birth. COVIS respectfully requests that its proposal receive proper review and consideration by the agency as we continue to welcome a collab collaborative path forward in the best interest of patient care. As we have heard over the last two days and as, have, as reflected in the docket, many organizations, including those who specifically represent at-risk populations, agree that Makina remains an important treatment option for reducing the risk of preterm birth. We remain committed to executing a robust plan to confirm the clinical benefit of Makina. We look forward to hearing the perspectives of the committee members and would like to thank CEDAR, uh, the advisory committee, and all of the public participants for the important and valuable perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now take a 15 minute break, so we'll resume at 9.30. Michael, do you want to give any instructions? Yep, uh, members and all that, please stick around. Uh, studio, please take us to break. Captioners, please, again, no captions at this time.
Good morning, and welcome back to FDA's Day 3 of the McKenna hearing. I will now hand it back to Dr. Celia Witten. Dr. Witten, take it away. Thank you. Can you put up the slide with the three questions on it? Thanks. Uh, we'll now proceed with questions to the committee that I presented earlier, although I'm not going to read them aloud again. For each question, we'll have a discussion and then a vote. While this hearing is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the committee. I'll, buy, I'll start by presenting each of the three questions which we will discuss in turn. Following the discussion for each question, there will be a vote on that question. Following the vote, I will ask each individual to state how they voted and why. After we have completed that process for question one, we'll go on to the next question and repeat the pro process for questions two and three. So we'll now proceed with the discussion for question one. Can you put question one um, up, please? So question one for discussion. Do the findings from trial 003... Uh, verify the clinical benefit of McKenna on neonatal morbidity and mortality from complications of preterm birth. Uh, I can't see the hands here. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so, are there any? Uh, so, Dr. Ellenberg, I'll call on you first. Well, I do think there isn't much to say, as uh, my understanding is that McKenna agrees with Cedar that the findings. From OO3. Sorry, I'm having trouble. You're cutting out, Dr. Ellenberg. Can, can you repeat that? Or I, I was saying, I, I think there's a my understanding is that McKenna agrees with Peter that the trial 003 does not verify the benefit uh, seen on the earlier trial. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy. Other, uh, Dr. Hudak? I find the question a little bit odd because um, trial 002 did not demonstrate a benefit on neonatal morbidity or mortality under the statistical analysis. Um, so trial 003 certainly didn't verify and didn't suggest a signal. I'm sorry, say, say that again. So yes, trial, trial 003 did not suggest any signal of a reduction on neonatal morbidity or mortality per the definition mm -hmm. used in that trial. Yeah. Thank you. Um, other co any other comments? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll, I think we can proceed to the vote with this one. So can you put up the uh, voting question? Thank you. So the voting question, um, which I will read. Uh, uh, so there are no further points of discussion. I will go on to the vote. Voting members of the advisory committee will use the Adobe Connect. Oh, I think those are instructions from Dr. Moon. Um, I'm going to read the voting question. Do the findings from trial 003 verify the clinical benefit of McKenna on neonatal morbidity and mortality? from complications of preterm birth. And Dr. Moon, can you read the instructions for voting? Voting members of the advisory committee will use the Adobe Connect platform to submit their vote for this hearing. The industry representative is a non-voting member. After the presiding officer has read the voting question into the record and all questions and discussions have been completed, the presiding officer will announce that voting will begin. Okay, I'll now restate this voting question one more time. Did the findings from trial 003 verify the clinical benefit of McKenna on neonatal morbidity and mortality from complications of preterm birth? The voting will now begin. You have 30 seconds before the vote closes. You have 15 seconds before the vote closes.
time has up, I will end the poll and broadcast the results. Dr. Moon, can you read the results? Voting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results have been displayed, I will read the votes into the record. For the record, we have 15 no. Okay, um, the, the, the vote results are displayed. I'll read the vote totals into the record, and then I'll read off the names and the vote for each voting member. Are you reading off the names and the votes? Yes. Dr. Coey? No. Dr. Kaimal voted no. Ms. Ellis voted no. Dr. Henderson voted no. Dr. Eisenberg voted no. Dr. Alukal voted no. Dr. Shields voted no. Dr. Harper voted no. Dr. McAdams DeMarco voted no. Dr. Gass voted no. Dr. Hudak voted no. Dr. Munn voted no. Dr. Lindsay voted no. Dr. Obaton voted no. Dr. Ellenberg voted no. Thank you. I will now ask everyone who's voted to state their name and their vote and an explanation for their vote or any additional comments you'd like to provide. Um, we'll start with Dr. Alokal. Dr. Alakal? Your phone is muted, sir. Excuse me. I don't have any additional comments uh, beyond what, what Dr. Ellenberg and Dr. Hudak said. Okay. Dr. Coey? Similar, no additional comment. Dr. Eisenberg? No additional comments. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg? Um, I voted no, no additional comments beyond what I said before. Okay. Dr. Ellis or Ms. Ellis? Hi, I voted no. Um, um, I have nothing to add. Uh, Dr. Gass? I voted no, no additional comments. Dr. Harper? I voted no, no additional comments. Thank you. Dr. Henderson? I voted no, no additional comments. Dr. Hudak? I voted no and no additional comments. Thank you. Dr. Kaimal? I voted no, no additional comments. Dr. Lindsay? I voted no and no additional comment. Dr. McAdams DeMarco? I voted no and no additional comments. Um, Dr. Munn? Yeah, I voted no and no additional comment. Dr. Obersham? Morning voted no, no additional comments as well. And uh, Dr. Shields. I voted no, and I have no uh, additional comments either. Okay. So um, in summary of the answer to this question, it's a consensus from the panel that uh, the findings from trial 003 don't verify the clinical benefit of McCain on neonatal morbidity and mortality for complications on preterm birth. Uh, we'll now proceed with question two and start with um, a discussion period. 
I'm going to put up the question, and we'll discuss this issue. Please use the raised hand icon to indicate you have a comment or question and lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon after you finish speaking. So the question for discussion is, does the available evidence demonstrate that McCain is effective for its approved indication of reducing the risk of preterm birth in women with a singleton pregnancy who have a history of singleton spontaneous preterm birth? So I just want to comment before we move on to discussion for this question that there's been considerable discussion about um, subgroups, uh, you know, subgroup analysis during the course of this meeting. And, uh, of course, all the discussions at the hearing are transcribed, and that transcript will be included as part of the official record of the proceedings. So any comments you make before and after this discussion and vote will be reviewed by FDA. But I do want to point out that the question under, under examination here is uh, related to McKenna and whether it's effective for its approved indication. So, um, you know, welcome comments on, on, on this question. So uh, we'll start out with Dr. Hudak. Yes, so thank you. So this is a limited question, as you point out, and it, <clears throat> it pertains to the totality of the evidence for both um, fully enrolled populations. Um, I think that there is agreement between uh, CEDAR and COVIS on this issue that um, looked at individually the uh, 002 study did provide, you know, a strong signal that um, use of McKenna in that population did reduce the risk of preterm birth in, a, uh, in women with a singleton pregnancy with a history of a prior spontaneous preterm single birth. Um, study 003, looking at the entire population, uh, provided no signal of benefit of McKenna. Um, looking at all of the women involved, um, irrespective of site of geography um, and so forth. So I would say that from the point of view of having two studies that provide similar signals, um, they did not. And so I think on this limited question, limited to the entire population of both studies, um, there is um, no evidence to demonstrate this effectiveness. Thank you. Um, other comments? Dr. Ellenberg? Yes, um, as Dr. Hudat said, the, the, um, the uh, OO3 study, um, the OO3 study was, uh, was negative. Um, and in regard to the issue of the power of this study, which was raised a number of times by COVID, um, th this could be of interest if the data from 003 was leaning. That is, if there was a, a substantial estimate of effect size, but because of the low event rate, it was not statistically significant, that would be one thing. That is not what we saw in 003. We saw something that did not, overall, did not uh, have any suggestion uh, of efficacy. Um, I think that the many uh, subset analyses that um, that were looked at, that were presented to us, um, uh, may may show some some uh, potential. Uh, this is always a tricky ground. Um, when I was at FDA, we certainly saw cases where a study was overall negative but looked very positive in a subgroup, and when a second study was done, there was no effect at all. So we know these can be false positives uh, when you have a big database and you hunt through for, for signals. Some of these signals may be worth uh, following up, but overall, um, I don't think that effectiveness has been demonstrated with the available evidence. Uh, thank you. Dr. Henderson? Thank you. I, um, I'm concerned that certainly the ME study was very problematic with the high 
uh, preterm delivery rate in the placebo, but I don't think that the O03 negates me. So I, there are problems with it, but it did show some interesting findings and um, uh, uh, reasonable findings uh, for del uh, deliver decreasing delivery at 37 weeks. I'm concerned about the O03 study, and it was pointed out certainly by the sponsors, the um, low level of minority women, and I'm, I'm concerned with the uh, target population of black women in the U.S. If we don't uh, focus on that target population, we may miss the opportunity to show a benefit of McKenna. I think that for certainly uh, race, uh, there's no, no biological possibility for, for it being affected uh, differently in, in, in different races of, po of populations. However, we do know that race is sort of a, a surrogate for racism and all the uh, uh, structural inequities that we talked about during the meeting. And I think that targeting a population that is at risk, um, particularly black women in the U.S., um, may show something that would be beneficial. Um, we certainly heard reports from uh, anecdotal um, from patients and providers and, and others. So I think that um, certainly the data other than MIS um, would say no, we don't have that evidence, but I think the O03 does not negate to some of the findings that we saw in, in MIS. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there are other comments from the advisory committee about uh, looking at the two different studies and the two different outcomes and what the interpretation would be. Dr. McAdams? Thank you, Dr. Mara McAdams. Marco, uh, my concern is that there is no effect measure modification by race. There was no interaction in either trial, um, suggesting that there will not be a differential impact of the medication on preterm birth uh, by race. And so to me, even in subgroups, there has not been shown uh, evidence in 003 that uh, preterm birth would be prevented with the use of this medication. Thank you. Uh, Annie Ellis? Hi, thank you. Um, I think I'm still just so um, disappointed that the strong signal that was seen in 002 was not confirmed. Um, I hear all the reasons why, um, you know, the trial on 003 um, might not have been um, adequately designed or, um, you know, include the proper um, population. Um, however, I really think that if 003 with all those flaws would have shown an effect, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here today. And I wish that we weren't sitting here today. But when I see one trial that was very strong and one trial that showed no difference, um, I feel a return, you know, to equipoise. We just don't know. Um, and, um, you know, the way the Christian is written, um, you know, for the approved indication, um, it, it, it just, we, we just don't know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on uh, Dr. Eisenberg. Yes, uh, my comment relates to the fact that there may be uh, geographical issues that uh, uh, have not necessarily been exposed in that uh, a large number of the uh, women in Nice were in uh, the uh, south of the United States, and there may be something geographically that affects the um, benefit that is seen of, of Makina in uh, 002. And uh, clearly, the differences in preterm birth in um, uh, outside the United States compared to inside the United States would argue that there are uh, geographical issues at play, uh, at least that is a hypothesis to be uh, explored, uh, and that may affect the um, benefit that was seen and, uh, and affect the um, success of Makina uh, in the uh, United States as well. Thank you. Um, other comments? 
Uh, you need to raise your hand or lower your hand, Dr. McAdams DeMarco. Um, other comments about the the two studies and the differences of the studies? I think she has another question, ma'am. Ah, okay. Good. I'll call on you again, Dr. McAdams DeMarco. Sorry. Thank you. No, I, I did have a second question uh, comment. So, um, with regard to ex-U.S. patients, the rates of preterm birth were undoubtedly known prior to the start of the trial by the sponsor, right? The, these things that are being brought up now as flaws were, in fact, identifiable during the design phase of the study. So I'm, I'm feeling that it's just a bit of a disingenuous argument to say that the study design now explains the null results, um, the, the uh, low rates in the uh, Ukraine and Russian populations now explain the results. Furthermore, the evidence provided by CEDAR uh, clearly shows that, again, there was not effect measure modification, so no differences of the drug's treatment um, in U.S. and non-U.S. patients. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other comments on this question? Uh, any, any comments on the studies or the other evidence that was provided during the discussions? Uh, Dr. Hudak? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, I think I think a lot of discussion will ensue with respect to the third question. Um, but um, since Dr. Ellenberg did bring this up, I do think, and I agree with her, that, um, you know, there is, um, there are pros and cons of looking at unstructured or unplanned sub-analyses. And um, I would echo her comment that, yes, many studies have shown in a sub-analysis that there may be an effect in a particularly limited population. Um, many times that effect is not confirmed. And um, so I think that, um, you know, a lot of argument has been made that this drug could benefit from further study, and I and I agree with that statement. Um, but that does not mean um, that the weight of the evidence, the entire population, um, can be discarded in this question. So um, I think we'll have some robust discussion with respect to question number three. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no further comments or discussion, we'll move on to the vote on this question. So any last uh, comments before I before we do that? Okay. Uh, so we've displayed slide with voting question two. Thank you. So I will now restate voting question two. The instructions for the vote is the same as previously. So uh, I'm going to restate quest voting question two. Does the available evidence demonstrate that McKenna is effective for its approved indication of reducing the risk of preterm birth in women with a singleton pregnancy who have a history of singleton spontaneous preterm birth? The voting will now begin. You have 30 seconds before the vote closes. You have 15 seconds before the vote closes.
I think we need one more vote. I did not receive a ballot. This is Michael Lindsay. Oh. Michael Lindsay, you're logged in. Um, you may have... Look at the bottom of your screen for Adobe Connect. Is that bottom center? Do you see the voting panel, Dr. Lindsay? I saw it for the first one, but I don't see it for the second one, and I see the question. I will move it. I'm going to move it on the screen for you. So, do you see it now? Okay. Do you see it now, sir? No, I still don't see it. I'm looking at the. Sir, why don't you log out and log back in real quick, please? Just stay on the okay, phone. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. okay. So we'll allow Dr. Lindsay to reconnect so we make sure we capture his vote. Just give us a moment. Okay. Here he comes. Do you see it now, sir? I see it now. Yes, I see it now. There you go. Okay. Okay. I'm good. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moon, do I have permission to close the vote? Yes. And I will broadcast the results. And if you can go ahead and read them. The vote res results are displayed. I will read the vote totals into the record. Then I will read off the name and the vote for each voting member. For the record, we have one yes, 13 no, and one abstention. Dr. Covey voted no. Dr. Kaimal voted no. Ms. Ellis voted no. Dr. Henderson voted yes. Dr. Eisenberg abstained. Dr. Olupo voted no. Dr. Shields voted no. Dr. Harper voted no. Dr. McAdam Marco voted no. Dr. Gass voted no. Dr. Hudak voted no, Dr. Munn voted no, Dr. Lindsay voted no, Dr. Obachan voted no, and Dr. Ellenberg voted no. Thank you. I will now ask everyone who voted to state their name and their vote and an explanation for their vote or any additional comments you would like to provide regarding the vote. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Alakal. Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Lupul. I voted no, uh, based specifically on the fact that the question is, is asking us whether or not we believe there to be uh, evidence of this effect. We've discussed over the past couple of days that really we can limit our consideration to the two studies that have been discussed and, and that we all sort of agree on uh, are less than ideal. Uh, obviously, that has to do uh, at a fundamental level with questions of study design and enrollment. And we do have in those two studies uh, divergent results. Uh, you know, this would this would be a confusing problem if you had two uh, less than ideal studies, but they they did show you the the same uh, meaningful effect. And so I think you can't conclusively answer this question that that yes, there's an effect. Uh, I'm not rambling through this, you know, just to hear myself talk. I think it's important to keep it, this in mind as we move on to the subsequent question of what are we, what are we to do next? Thank you. Dr. Coey? Um, yeah, I voted no as well, and um, I really agree with what Dr. Lukel just said. You know, fundamentally, the question before us is, has it been shown to be effective for the indication of prior spontaneous preterm birth? And I think when you look at that body of evidence, the answer has to be no. The issue of subgroups might be something we might address going forward, but that's not in this question, so I voted no. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eisenberg? Hello? 
Yes. Uh-huh. Did you ask for my uh, comment? Ex- yes, please. Yes. So I abstained because the question, is it effective, uh, you could, uh, if you turn that around and say, is it not effective, one cannot say that it is not effective either. And I think that the, uh, the question, um, although you cannot demonstrate an effect, you, can also, you, you, cannot, you, you cannot say that, that these studies in their totality demonstrated effectiveness. You cannot say that these studies also did, uh, did not demonstrate effectiveness because of all the discussion uh, points that have been made previously. And so it really depends. And I think additional studies need to be done in order to answer the question. I don't think that question can be answered with the data that we have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg? Oh, um, this is Annie Ellis. Um, I voted no. Um, you know, we, we don't know if it's effective or not effective because the two trials um, had different results. Um, and I would just take to take one moment to just thank the women um, who volunteered to participate in both these studies. That even though um, the results were different, the information matters, and your participation matters. That's all. Thank you, um, Dr. Ellenberg. Yeah, I voted. Um, I voted no. Uh, I think we have one study. Um, that was positive on an intermediate clinical endpoint, and one much larger study um, that um, was not positive on any endpoint, not even uh, not even leaning. Um, so it seems clear to me that efficacy was not demonstrated. There is no way that studies can ever definitively prove that a drug had no effect. Even if we had two definitively negative studies, um, it would be possible. Uh, there's there's always uncertainty in these um, in these issues, but um, so that's that's not what we're saying. I wouldn't say that there's proof that it's ineffective, but I think we're basically back to square zero uh, where we were before anything was studied. We just don't know. So there's I, I believe there's no um, no demonstration of of, uh, of effect. Thank you, Dr. Gass. Yes. Um, generally, we expect the larger studies to iron out some problems in the original smaller studies, and that didn't uh, um, pan out in this case. Uh, the company has indicated that they think they can do uh, another trial that would be more convincing, and I would encourage them to do that because certainly this is an important uh, health issue in this country. Thank you. Um, Dr. Harper? Hi, Lori Harper. I voted no. Um, I don't really have additional comments com- uh, compared to what has been said. I think the body of evidence does not support effectiveness for the general population of women with a prior singleton preterm birth. Thank you. Dr. Henderson? Hi. Dr. Henderson, sorry. Um, thank you. I voted yes, and it, it really comes down to the MEES trial. I voted yes um, when we first uh, did the, the preliminary uh, approval, and I think because I think there's some evidence that it, it is beneficial, and I think if there's absolutely no benefit with the risk that we've already uh, demonstrated or to discuss during the, the hearing, then it shouldn't be on the market. I mean, if, if, I think if there's no benefit, then clearly there's no reason to have any risk, and I think the MEES supports that there may be some benefit, and I think that the O03 trial was not, um, obviously was not, um, um, helpful. Um, it was a negative trial with all the uh, limitations we talked about. So I think uh, given the MEES and um, given the fact that that suggests there is some benefit, that warrants taking the risks that we've been submitting women to for these years. So I, I voted yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hudak? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think um, this is an interesting question, interesting responses. I voted no um, because I think from a intellectually honest perspective answering this particular question, 
Um, the weight of the evidence does not support effectiveness for the indication, um, the labeling indication, which is the entire population. Um, I think that, um, you know, Dr. Eisenberg's careful semantic uh, consideration is something that I do understand, uh, but that's not incompatible with the no vote in my mind. I, I do think the question asked whether or not there is sufficient evidence to say that this drug is effective. Um, I think saying no to that is uh, does not close out the possibility that the drug may be effective in certain situations and certain populations. But as the question is written, I think the in intellectually coherent answer is no. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kaimal? Um, Angela Kaimal, I voted no. And so I think sort of echoing some of the prior comments, which is to say that, you know, much of the discussion is focused on about the fact that more study is needed. So given the way that the question is worded as to whether the evidence so far demonstrates effectiveness for the approved indication, which is prior preterm birth less than 37 weeks, it seems clear that while we might want to investigate an additional population for that specific question, the evidence does not support uh, that this medication is effective. Thank, Thank you. Um, Dr. Lindsay? Yeah, I voted no also. Uh, by looking at the fatality of the evidence, uh, the way the question is worded, there was no other option but to vote no. But as a clinician, I'm sort of disappointed that the drug has not been shown to be more effective. Thank you. Um, Dr. McAdams DeMarco? Hey, this is Dr. Munn. I voted no. Um, and just, I, I guess I'd like to echo what Dr. Hudak said about intellectual honesty, um, that the body of evidence right now doesn't currently support um, its indication. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Dr. McAdams DeMarco. Hi, thank you. So under accelerated approval, the sponsor was required to conduct a high quality trial to confirm this endpoint and it failed to do so. That with the totality of the evidence, including high quality real world evidence from the pharmacopoeia studies suggests to me that um, the only way to answer this uh, question was no. Thank you. Um, Dr. Obersham. Yes, Sarah Obertan, I also voted no, and similar to some of my colleagues that have presented here, Dr. Lindsay, I agree. I'm really sad uh, about the findings from the O3 trial, and I I, I, I can't say anything else other than the, the deep sadness, but uh, the tally of the evidence showed that it doesn't, it's not effective, and to answer this question, I also voted no. Thank you. And Dr. Shields? Yes. Uh, this is Chris Shields. I also voted no. Um, I hope that the uh, sponsor will go on and do additional trials to um, more definitively answer this question in certain populations. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I'll summarize the discussion and the vote by saying that um, the vote was 13 no one yes and one abstain. The, there was, I think, general agreement in the committee that um, there was some disappointment that trial 003 didn't uh, provide a better outcome, um, but uh, that the weight of the evidence didn't support uh, a yes vote on this question. The one point that was made by the person who abstained and, and there was support from this from you know, a number of the committee members was that the studies didn't show ineffectiveness. They simply didn't show, the evidence simply didn't show effectiveness, and further study was encouraged. And then there was also uh, one member who believed that the answer should be yes based on the weight of evidence from the MICE trial. So that's the, that's the summary of the vote. And we're now going to proceed with question three. And as before, we're going to start with the discussion period. Um, I'm going to, so we have the question put up. I don't know, can you make it any larger on this? 
So I don't know. People should have it in front of them, I hope. Um, but I'm going to read the question, and then we'll have a discussion. So the question for discussion, just, just a second, is should FDA allow McKenna to remain on the market? As part of that discussion, you may consider, you may discuss whether the benefit risk profile supports retaining the product on the market, what, what types of studies could provide confirmatory evidence to verify the clinical benefit of McKenna on neonatal morbidity and mortality from complications of preterm birth? And then the voting question, considering your responses to the previous questions, both in the discussions and the vote, should FDA allow McKenna to remain on the market while an appropriate confirmatory study is designed and conducted? And as I mentioned for the previous study, this question is asking about McKenna with its labeled indication of reducing the risk of preterm birth in women with a singleton pregnancy who have a history of singleton spontaneous preterm birth. Um, however, if you have additional comments about some of the populations that were discussed during you know, the meeting yesterday, you know, you can make them during the discussion period, but the vote should be on that specific question. Uh, and I also want to clarify that the, the bullet about studies that could provide confirmatory evidence, there was considerable discussion about a study proposed by the sponsor yesterday, which was a study aimed at looking at the intermediate clinical endpoint. Um, and they also briefly mentioned an observational study to look at uh, confirmatory evidence. So when you're talking about studies, um, it would be helpful to be clear about what kind of study and what kind of study objectives um, we are you know, you're, you're discussing or recommending. So anyway, I will open it up for discussion. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Eisenberg. Uh, I believe that um, the product should remain on the market in order to be able to do uh, a study that could answer the question. I think the point that if the drug is taken off the market, then uh, people will question whether to go on it and uh, uh, will make it extraordinarily difficult to recruit patients for the study. I think that, it, I think that uh, you have to weigh that if it's taken off the market, then being in the study may be the only way to get the drug. On the other hand, you may have compounding pharmacies that come into the picture, and I think that uh, weighing all of the pros and cons, I would say that uh, it would be a, uh, it, the, the weight is towards keeping McKenna on the market in order to be able to do a confirmatory study, with the caveat that if you cannot recruit and if you don't show a benefit uh, uh, at, during an interim analysis to an intermediate outcome, then uh, you stop the study and then um, uh, take it off the market. The types of studies, I think, that could provide confirmatory, ev confirmatory evidence, uh, uh, randomized controls, a uh, placebo-controlled trial uh, would be one uh, type of study. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, there is an arm of patients that uh, are allowed to stay in the study but uh, select the treatment uh, if they do not want to be randomized and they're followed forward. That is one type of study. Uh, the other type uh, might be a uh, comparative effectiveness trial, uh, and uh, the comparator uh, would be some, some uh, comparator that uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists could agree upon. I am not going to get in, into the design of that study, but I think that that might actually uh, improve the recruitment if there was uh, something that one could compare in terms of reducing um, uh, preterm birth. And I do think that um, uh, ex extending the amount of time before delivery uh, does reduce neonatal morbidity because it reduce, it uh, likely reduces 
uh, the neonatal intensive care stay and other uh, uh, contributing outcomes that uh, so, so I think that uh, that is an important intermediate outcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kaimal? Um, so I actually have a clarifying question. It seems to me that um, much of what we've spent the past two days talking about is what additional studies we'd like to do. Um, and at least to me, it feels as though the discussion, both from Cedar and from COVID, with all of the carefully prepared information, does focus on the idea that we have unanswered questions that we would really like to have answered. And overwhelmingly, everyone who has testified, whether it was a patient or a provider, knows that this is an impossible clinical question that we really need a better answer to. My question, which I guess maybe it's for Cedar, I'm not sure exactly, is that what's being proposed by COVID is to say that they will narrow the indication to a higher risk population and then simultaneously perform a study in that higher risk population. And my question is really just from a regulatory perspective, is that a possibility, which it was sort of raised during the discussion, but I think not really definitively answered. Um, and I know that obviously the situation was so long was that, that was the, there was accelerated approval and then there was an ongoing study for the same indication. But this, we're now in a different situation with the body of evidence that exists now. And so, I guess that's my question for whoever can answer as to if this is proposed, is that actually a feasible way forward? Because I don't think there's anybody who feels that we have definitively settled this question. The question is, what is the best way to move forward? I'll pause there. Okay. Well, I think um, I will give you an answer, which probably won't be entirely satisfying, but it's, it's probably the best answer that uh, I can give which is we need the advisory committee to provide its scientific and clinical um, opinions and conclusions on the specific questions we've posed to you at the hearing through voting on the questions. And so I've already explained that for question three for the vote, we're asking specifically if we should allow McKenna to remain on the market, meaning remain on the market with its current indication while an appropriate confirmatory study is designed and conducted. So that's the question we're asking you to vote on. Um, that's also the discussion question, but nonetheless, um, I, I think you can discuss other options or other issues you might suggest, and, and when you vote, you can explain in your vote what other considerations you think might apply. I can assure you that all the discussions at the hearing, which are tra transcribed, uh, become part of a transcript that is the official record of this proceeding, and your comments matter. Your comments matter before and after the vote, and they'll be reviewed by FDA before the commissioner and chief scientist issues a final decision on this matter. So uh, I hope that answers your question, um, at least to the best of my ability. That's the answer. I was going to say, but the answer there is that the question before us to vote on is should McKenna stay in the market for the current labeled indication while additional study is done. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Dr. That Witten? My question. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, hold on. No, no. Hold on. Uh, Dr. Witten, we have uh, both Cedar and Colvis uh, wanted an opportunity to answer. It's your call. Um, they can make a, a very brief answer each. Uh, Would you like to start with? And um, we can start with Covis. All right. Thank you, Dr. Witten. We would just point out that this question is not tied to the current indication. The question here is asking for judgment about whether the current benefit risk profile supports the product remaining on the market. We believe there are ample uh, authority that Cedar FDA possess to make appropriate changes to labeling as we discussed, but we would encourage the question to be answered as written, and it's not about the current indication. Thank you. Now, can we hear from Cedar? All right, Dr. Peter Stein, uh, Office of New Drugs, Cedar. I do want to be clear that uh, our assessment is that there is not substantial evidence um, that supports um, the effectiveness of this drug, uh, so does not support the current indication. And as I pointed out earlier, 
uh, the evidence to provide support for any other indication is really based upon post hoc non pre specified uh, analysis that were inconsistent between studies, which we don't consider constituting substantial evidence of effectiveness. And for there to be any indication, the current indication or a narrowed indication, there still has to be substantial evidence that 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 the drug provides that benefit. So once again, regardless of whether we're talking about the current indication or we would be talking about a narrowed indication, that still must be supported by persuasive evidence, substantial evidence that the drug has that effect. And our conclusion, as I earlier noted, was that there is not substantial evidence of effectiveness. The drug has not been shown to be effective with regard to its current in indication and with regard to any other use of the drug the post hoc non pre specified analysis do not constitute substantial evidence and do not demonstrate the effectiveness of the drug for any narrowed indication. Thank you. So now we'll have lots of other comments from the committee, I see. Dr. Fox. Hi, uh, Michelle Fox. I am the industry representative, so I'm not allowed to vote, but I did want to express um, my opinions uh, for consideration. Um, in drug development, there is a pre-specified way of what you have to do to get a drug approved. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of products that are under development fail and never make it to the market. And I'm hearing from CEDAR that if this drug had gone through the regular pathway, it never would have made it to the market because it had not, the data does not uh, establish that it is effective. Um, I keep that in mind as I'm trying to consider whether this drug should come off the market while hopefully the sponsor finds uh, an ability to study it more and see in which specific populations it may work. But I, I don't feel that the it should remain on the market while that is being done. Um, steps were accelerated because of the nature of the disease and the confirmatory, confirmatory studies failed to show effect. And so I don't feel that it's appropriate to continue to have the FDA state that they're going to leave a drug on the market that they continue to state is ineffective so that women can take it while the sponsor goes back to figure out if the drug actually works. Um, I understand it may be hard to study this uh, if the drug is withdrawn, but I think that it needs to be clear that the drug is being withdrawn due to concerns for efficacy. And any clinical trial that anyone uh, is enrolled in in a drug that has not been approved and is under development, they don't know if the drug works. That's the whole point of the clinical trial. So if we don't know if the drug works, we need to go back to finding out if it does. And, and so I don't really think that withdrawing it should be uh, preventing people from uh, enrolling in the trial. It's not a safety concern. So it should not be as detrimental as it's being made out to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Hudak? Yes, thank you. I have uh, a little bit of introductory comment and then I'll address the question. Um, but, you know, I think we've all listened over the course of uh, two going on two and a half days now to many physicians, patients, and advocacy representatives, and certainly we've heard a great deal of passion on both sides of this question. And I, I want to acknowledge that, and I think those are legitimate feelings that people have, and <clears throat> you know, their experience, their background, and, and uh, all of that. Um, and I also fully empathize with the desire um, expressed by patients and physicians to have some therapeutic option for this really critical issue of preterm birth, which is a major, major problem in this country. But, you know, I would point out, on the other hand, that, um, you know, certainly in my field, and I can't speak for others, but in neonatology, our short history is replete with many, many examples of therapies being used as a therapy because we need a therapy um, that had later proved to be at best ineffective and in worst case, actually harmful. Um, not saying that that's the case for this drug, but I think I think we need to consider that. You know, I'm also sensitive to the disparity issue that's been raised. 
So we've heard people say that, you know, it would be not a good thing to um, pull the drug from the market because that would reduce access by vulnerable populations to a potentially effective therapy. But I've also heard people say it would be unfair to keep the drug on the market and expose especially these vulnerable populations to an ineffective therapy that carries a tremendous burden um, of, you know, weekly injections from before 20 weeks onwards. So I think people have spoken to that issue on both sides. With respect to this particular question here, I think that um, Dr. Stein's answer was absolutely what I expected it to be, um, having spent many, many years on FDA advisory committees. Um, I think it is important for us to make sure that we avoid um, uh, going down a pathway that will cause regulatory chaos. I think that the accelerated approval has very clear sort of um, expectations. Um, and these were not met in study 003. So I think rather than going down some rabbit hole and sort of suggesting that this, this, this study should remain on the market, uh, not necessarily because of the benefit or risk profile, but because of the opportunistic issue of we need further study and only by keeping this drug on the market will we be able to affect that study is, is not um, appropriate and, um, and so forth. With respect to the issue of benefit risk, I think that um, benefit risk profile, as we've heard, um, in totality, does not support retaining the product in the market, you know, for the indicated uh, label um, use. I take some issue, I think, with the feasibility of doing studies um, with the drug on the market or off the market. So. Just to sort of elaborate on that a little bit, if the drug were to remain on the market, we have some data from COVID about physician surveys that say physicians would be more likely to um, enroll patients in the study of efficacy in this, in this limited group, high-risk group. However, from a patient perspective, that means that there are going to be a lot of women who are going to get this therapy um, for which we have no evidence of efficacy. And if I were a patient in the high-risk group and the drug were on the market uh, with an approved indication, I would say, I'm not participating in this study because why are you saying that, you know, you can't say on one side of your mouth that we don't know whether it's effective or not, and therefore we need to study in you who are particularly at high risk, but say, you know, it's available to anybody else on the market. As a patient, I would say, no, I'll take, I'll take the medication. It would be the rare patient, I think, that would have the equipoise to sort of read through all of this and understand the nuances involved in this and agree to participate. So I think even if you had more physicians willing to participate in trials, the rate of patient recruitment would be infinitesimal. Um, off the market, however, I think one could persuade physicians and patients to participate in the study because it is an area then that everybody is saying, you know, we have equipoise, we really don't know, there are some signals that it may be effective, it needs to be verified. So I'll say that. And then finally, in terms of the types of studies um, that could be used, I think one has to go back to the drawing board on this because I think both the obstetrical and the neonatal outcomes as they were originally put together for study 002, as I said yesterday, in retrospect, are not the best outcome measures. And um, they don't provide full information, and I think they need to be carefully reconsidered. I think particularly for the neonatal outcomes, if they are redefined intelligently, um, you could uh, potentially hope to identify a clear benefit if you achieve the primary outcome of, or if you achieve the surrogate outcome of significantly reducing preterm birth in a much more limited number of patients. And I particularly agree with the suggestion uh, by one of the members yesterday um, that um, in terms of the eligibility criteria that the study be limited to um, women with a 
past history of your preterm birth at 32 weeks or some lower point and younger than that because beyond 32 weeks, I think the even in the sub-analysis, the evidence of efficacy is very, very mild, you know, less than a week prolongation of um, gestation. And the effects that you're going to see in the neonatal population because of that about 32 weeks are really going to be very, very minimal. So I think you're really going to want to target the very high-risk group of mothers and, you know, infants. So for this question here, I would say I do not think that FDA should allow Makina to remain on the market. I think to do so would introduce complete regulatory chaos and set precedent that we don't want to have go forward for other medications. And I've already talked about the study. So Thank my you. answer is no. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg? Yes, thank you. Susan Ellenberg. Um, I think there are two main rationales that have been put forward for keeping this on the market now. Uh, one is the unmet need issue, and one is the issue of the feasibility of doing a uh, study that I think everybody agrees, both COVID and the, and the FDA agreed, would be needed. With regard to the unmet need, I would say that unmet need is not a sufficient basis for having a, having a, a, a product available um, when you don't know it's effective. Nobody needs a drug that doesn't work. <clears throat> While we don't know for sure that the drug doesn't work in any, um, in any uh, population, uh, we don't have good evidence that it does work. In any population, we have hints and suggestions that um, cannot be taken as um, even close to definitive. Um, I, 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 remembering my days of working in AIDS research when um, in the early days, AIDS activists were uh, anxious to have access to anything that was um, in development and, and quickly learned that having uh, lots of drugs in their medicine cabinet that uh, where they didn't know which ones worked, if any of them worked, was not useful. Um, with regard to the study, um, as I said before, I think we're back to square one on this. We're back to the to the situation where you know you just don't know. Like at the beginning of a uh, at the beginning of a development program, after you do phase two, you usually have um, you have promising results from phase two. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't go on into phase three. Um, and then uh, you do a, a, a phase three study. Um, and I think that's where we are with this drug. Um, I don't really buy <clears throat> that, that a new study couldn't be done if, the, if, if McKenna was removed uh, from the market. This could be presented to the community as a situation not where we don't know that the drug works, but that there's not sufficient evidence to show that it works. Uh, and we are we need to try and find that out because there are some of these hints. Um, I agree uh, with the previous statement that that it's not obvious to me why uh, it's going to be easier to do it if the drug stays on the market. Um, you know, people will be able to get it then uh, and, and may not choose to be in the study. Uh, furthermore, if it's on the market, it could. Um, tamper the development of other drugs. I don't know what else is out there in the pipeline for preventing uh, preterm birth, but having something on the market that some people clearly believe in uh, seems to me to be make it more challenging for another uh, manufacturer to do a placebo-controlled trial, which I think is needed since we don't have evidence that anything really works um, in this study. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'll call on Dr. Alukal. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alukal. I, I, so I'm a urologist and therefore had no clinical experience with this drug, um, and I think that maybe puts me on, on different footing than a lot of the, the people who have um, weighed in. Uh, sometimes an outsider's perspective can be useful. Uh, I, although I do find myself, I, much of what I was about to say, you know, I think has been summarized by, by Dr. Hudak and Dr. Ellenberg. The, the general point I wanted to make was I think there are some false choices being presented here. Uh, the idea that we should be uh, allowing the drug to remain on the market for the purposes of being able to perform a confirmatory study 
Uh, as was alluded to already, you know, the overwhelming majority of drugs that are studied are not actually uh, um, available uh, for, for the general population with an indication, obviously, they're being studied. And the, the follow-on to that was made by several people yesterday, uh, the, the idea that, well, people would be disinclined to participate in a study if they suspected that the drug had been on the market and then withdrawn. Uh, at the same time, we have a number of people who pointed out there doesn't appear to be anything else clinically available to patients in this space. So I, I suspect if there is the clinical need that is being, uh, you know, uh, maintained to exist, there should not be a problem enrolling people into this study, even if the drug were withdrawn from the market. Uh, relatedly, I, I, I think when we start talking about the idea that, that there are certain uh, uh, members of the population who are going to be disadvantaged by not having access to this drug, that implies something that we don't yet know. It implies that the drug is effective. We don't know that. All of us have been discussing that from various perspectives. Uh, this morning in particular, and it implies that the drug is safe. And and so we, we don't yet have a definitive answer on that uh, as well. So I, I certainly think further studies warranted. Obviously, this is a, a, a truly meaningful clinical need, uh, but the idea that the drug is allowed to remain on the market during that window of time when we don't have data supporting a decision to do that, uh, I, I find it hard to accept that, especially when, you know, as, as has been alluded to, the idea that, that all medications have some risk associated with them, why are we exposing people to that risk when we can't clearly state to them uh, this medication has benefits for you in terms of your clinical need? Thank you. Dr. Lindsay? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of share my perspective. I was involved in the 2019 meeting uh, where this question was first discussed. And my perception is really, it's been modified, but at, at that meeting, my perception was that we had a positive trial and a negative trial, and that there needed to be a tiebreaker or a third trial done. And then in the two-year interim, we're now here discussing taking Makina off of the market. And in terms of the discussion, I've, I've learned something, but it's still my feeling that we still need to have a, a third trial sort of as a tiebreaker to look at the issue because it's such an important clinical question. And I'm looking at the totality of the evidence, I can't honestly say that Makina is effective, but I'm still not convinced that there isn't a subpopulation that it may be effective in. Now, the question that you asked is whether the medication should still be on the market while that question is being addressed. And I'm learning something in the discussion in terms of whether or not it needs to be, but I really want to reiterate the importance of at least doing additional trials because I left the meeting thinking that I don't know whether there would be a sponsor who would be willing to invest money in terms of doing a trial. And after hearing this discussion in, in over the last course of the last couple of days, uh, my skepticism about that is, is, is not as, as great. So in summary, I think there needs to be another trial. Whether the medication needs to stay on the market, if you can do the trial without the medication being FDA approved, then I'm, I'm supportive of that. So those are my comments. Thank you. Ms. Ellis? Um, hi. Um, like um, Dr. Lindsay, I also um, participated in the 2019 Advisory Committee, um, and um, it was, you know, just to bring things back to a human level, it is brutally painful that there's nothing available. That in 2022, in the United States of America, the the inequities that exist and, you know, the state of, you know, neonatal morbidity and, you know, for mothers, um, it's just painful on so many levels. So I'm thankful for the research. I'm thankful for the discussion. Um, but I, I know what it's like to be put on bed rest in a fight to try to bring you know, a baby who is smaller than the preterm baby that happened earlier um, 
you know, to, to keep her viable and um, give her the best chance. I know what it's like to go on a drug that was the best available at the time, which for me was oral tubulin, which was later found out to be some have some really bad um, adverse effects, you know, to the mother. Um, I also know what it's like to, you know, be on bed rest for six to eight weeks and crawl out of bed against your doctor's orders so that you can care for a three-year-old. But I have to get, so I just wanted to bring that human level, you know, back to this. When I look at the benefit risk question, um, the safety profile overall, it seems, it seems safe. You know, the long term, you know, are some unknowns, but it feels mostly safe, although it is unclear. But I also know that the FDA requires that new drugs be safe and effective, not safe or effective. I also am familiar with the accelerated approval pathway. And um, please forgive my, um, you know, not sophisticated language here, but I see it as conditional, and it's based on surrogate endpoints or intermediate endpoints that require a confirmatory trial. So it's kind of like driving on, driving on your donut spare until it's convert, confirmed and then converted to full approval. And, um, you know, nothing at this point um, rises to that level of evidence. And so we continue to have an urgent unmet need that requires more data. And, you know, I appreciate, I think we're all on the same team here. We all want what's best for mothers and babies. And, um, you know, from a biostatistical viewpoint, which I have no experience, and it really takes a lot of effort for me to even have a basic understanding. I, but I do know, you know, that we need um, the p-value so that it can reach statistical significance and be meaningful and be a real result. And sometimes when I see a lot of mathematical gymnastics being used to cut things in different ways and, you know, try to squeeze out a subset to that has benefit, I, I want to, you know, I, I have concerns, but I also know that this is retrospective and anything retrospective requires prospective validation. So we, we, st- we need this information. I think everybody agrees we need this information. And, you know, is it feasible to get this information while it's still on the market? And, you know, if I was presented, you know, with participation in a clinical trial and randomization, um, if this was on the market, I would find a way to get it. I would want McKenna you know, based on, on NICE. Um, and I think, um, you know, we need a bigger study than what's proposed. Um, and we, we just need to find answers and, um, and we need it as quickly as possible. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McAdams DeMarco. Thank you. Um, And first and foremost, I just want to thank Ms. Ellis. Uh, Her uh, participation has been stellar, and the um, sharing of her experience has been incredibly moving to me and I imagine to all the committee members. So first and foremost, thank you. I, too, am a mother, and I deeply feel for those who are faced with such limited options uh, and continuing uh, and moving towards a second pregnancy. I I am going to switch hats and put on my epidemiology and statistics hat, though, to review the evidence. Uh, I've been trained and been doing this for the last two decades, and I really want to echo a lot of the comments that Dr. Hudak and Dr. Ellenberg um, have stated earlier. The only point that I want to drive home here is to say that when a drug is approved by the FDA, there is an expectation that it's both safe and effective. If we are thinking about equipoise uh, that Dr. Hudak brought up, um, I believe that the only way we can really affirm that there is equipoise is once a drug is removed from the market. This, to me, goes back to, you know, basic first principles of clinical trials and would be the most ethical way to move forward with randomizing patients to either receive the uh, study drug or the control. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. Gass? Yes, uh, this um, is a uh, difficult, challenging, and uh, somewhat painful uh, discussion when we look at it from all angles. But I'd like to take a step backwards and just uh, look at the bigger picture. First of all, the company has already had the benefit of an accelerated approval process. And when we look at the data, we see that there's no strong evidence that the drug is effective. And standing back from this um, more distant perspective, to look at the FDA and the advisory committee essentially disregarding a large study that said there was no effectiveness to this product and yet allowing it to continue on the market, I think would reflect very poorly on the FDA and our advisory committee. So to do this would undermine the credibility of these two groups. So I think from that perspective, I would recommend that the drug be withdrawn until we can get the data that really show effectiveness, which is what is required of most drugs that are approved. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Obershawn? Thank you, Sarah Obershawn. I, I too will echo the humanist side of this whole discussion and for Ms. Ellis as well. And we certainly owe a debt of gratitude to all the pregnant people who are participating in trials. It's still important, and I hope they all understand that. From the perspective here, um, some of the things I'm, I'm struggling with is um, having another trial, which may fully be uh, warranted. My question is how to have that personal conversation with patients, and we truly have equipoise, and if the drug is on the market, how to have that conversation with them. It's like, well, it's FDA approved, but we still don't understand if it's beneficial or not in the subset of population. Would you be part of the trial? I think that would be really difficult to recruit. And I understand that the survey that was done, and that is somewhat reassuring, but I am also really concerned about that really coming to fruition. It's really hard to have trials done uh, in our field. Um, and, and to have that organized, I think, will take longer than the four to six weeks. The four to six, week, four to six years, forgive me, is the, the time frame possibly of what we would need in terms of patients. But the, the time frame ahead of that would be very long, um, and I, I'm concerned certainly about that. Um, my biggest thing, I think, is that discussion with the patients. My other one is um, my concern for the outcome. I, I think what we're really worried about is the neonatal outcomes, right? They're worried about how those babies are going to do in the NICU. Is there a benefit if we are uh, delivering them at a later gestational age? But we, we hope that gestational age is a good surrogate. I just worry about um, that being helpful in this particular situation. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. Dr. Eisenberg? So this discussion um, has been very helpful, and I really do um, value the comments made by Dr. Hudak and Ellenberg and everyone else. Uh, and uh, but the, uh, so I am still struggling with, uh, you know, if it is the framework uh, of you know of the FDA that uh, we have to have effectiveness. I think that it's really hard to backtrack, um, you know, once you've given accelerator approval. Uh, and I would say that the uh, subsequent trial, although it's been done, has not been, uh, has many flaws. And I think that the question that I have is, uh, at what point does one remove the accelerator approval uh, if you haven't had an adequately, uh, well, uh, if, you, if the study that has been done was flawed and is unable to answer the question, uh, that, that's my question. I, I, I do um, value the points made by uh, the other members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, are there any? Sorry. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Ah, Dr. Henderson. Hi, thank you. 
Um, I'm, I'm concerned as I when I voted um, on the second the second question. Uh, if if the drug has no benefit, given that there are risks, if we've already talked about the thromboembolic and other ones, um, I, it, it clearly should not be on the market. If there's no benefit and there is risk, then there shouldn't be. Uh, there's no reason for it to be on the market. But I do think there is some benefit from the NIST nice trial. Um, and I think that one of the risks that we haven't talked about, some in the pregnancy in the trial, but we, it's not in the um, uh, insert, is the intergenerational risk. And I think that um, if we go forward with another study and even this current um, availability on the insert, there should be a discussion a discussion to patients about the potential inter intergenerational risk. Uh, we've mentioned thalidomide and DES. My guess is that most of the young people who take this don't know anything about thalidomide or DES. I think that there should be a little brief blurb in there about that. And perhaps the, the my sponsor might add to their observational study a registry, something on the order of the DES registry that's maintained at the University of Chicago, so we can uh, follow these um, these offspring. And my concern about taking it off the market is um, the the prevalence of the compounded. Uh, uh, um, 17 hydroxy in all the pharmacies that are around, um, that, well, certainly in the Bronx and in Manhattan, um, and I, I worry about that. And I think if this is not, if it, this is taken off the market, my concern is that the compounding will increase. And I think if it is um, taken off the market and a study moves forward, I think that many people would not participate because they would not want to get the placebo; they'll get the compounding. So I'm concerned about um, if. if if there is any possibility that there may be a benefit, that um, we have already put that out to the professions and also to patients that they may seek it in another way and get something that we don't have any control over and we don't know what the fetus may be exposed to. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions before we go on for the vote? Okay. If there are no other comments or questions, we're going to move on to the voting. The voting process will be the same as it was for questions one or one and two. I'm going to restate the voting question now, re voting question three. Considering your responses to the previous questions, both in the discussions and votes, should FDA allow McKenna to remain on the market while an appropriate confirmatory study is designed and conducted? And I'll just mention that as before, you'll get the opportunity to explain your votes uh, after the voting process. The voting will now begin. You have 30 seconds before the vote closes. Thank you. Do you have 15 again. seconds before the vote closes? We're still missing one vote. Is there someone who needs yeah. help? Michael, is that you again? Yeah. Yep, let's have you do it. Let's have you just log through a seat. Uh, just log out again and come back in again. Okay, sir. He's coming back now. The voting has closed and is now complete once the vote results have been displayed, I will read the vote into the record. Okay, we have for the record one yes, 14 no, and no abstentions.
Dr. Curley voted no. Dr. Kaimal voted no. Ms. Ellis voted no. Dr. Henderson voted yes. Dr. Eisenberg voted no. Dr. Oluko voted no. Dr. Shields voted no. Dr. Harper voted no. Dr. McAdams DeMarco voted no. Dr. Gass voted no. Dr. Hudak voted no. Dr. Munn voted no. Dr. Lindsay voted no. Dr. Ogachan voted no. And Dr. Ellenberg voted no. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call the members one at a time to uh, state your vote and explain the reasons behind your vote. Dr. Aluko? Sorry, uh, Angela Kimmel. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I have struggled with this um, mightily, and I'm very appreciative of all the information that was um, presented. There was a speaker yesterday that said the most terrifying thing you can tell a patient is that there's nothing to do. And unfortunately, in obstetrics, there are many situations where I find myself in that situation. And the compulsion to do something is strong, both on the part of the patient and on the part of the provider. Um, wasn't sure whether I should share this or not, but I myself also had a preterm baby. I had a baby in the NICU that, um, and then had a subsequent pregnancy where I had to think about what to do. And so having participated in that conversation so many times as a provider, then to also have the experience as a patient, um, you know, just brought home what I had seen on the faces of so many people that I have taken care of before. But while I think that uh, there are not significant harms that have been shown with McKenna, there are still costs to continuing to have it on the market while we try to figure out who it might work for. And I do think that that's a very important question to answer, and the additional study is needed. In no way does my no vote say that that is not what needs to happen. 100% there needs to be another trial, because I want to believe that there is a solution for preterm birth and that this might be part of what our instruments could be to try to help people. But I think that when we leave something on the market that hasn't been shown to be effective, we lose out on other investigations that might be pursued. We spend money that could be spent elsewhere for all of the many problems in maternal and child health that need our attention. And the last thing I would say is that, again, faced with that powerless feeling, is Paul's hope really any hope at all? So I hope that in the future we are able to do a study that shows us who the population is that will benefit from this medication, if any. And we, when we have that evidence, we're able to go to that patient population confidently and say, this is the thing that I think will help you. I also want to believe better of my colleagues when we talk about saying, well, we need to have something to do so that we don't do other things that might be more harmful. We do have an evidence base in obstetrics, not the same as maybe in some other fields, but I hope that we will turn to our evidence and that our professional societies will guide us in thinking about how best to take care of patients with the evidence and interventions that we have available. And it is very weighty to think about the most vulnerable populations that we take care of and concern about not giving them access to a treatment that might help them. But on the same, in the same conversation, to think that I'm going to give a very vulnerable population an ineffective treatment also just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, so I know lots of others have struggled with this question as well, um, but those are the reasons why I think it now. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alukal? Thank you, uh, Dr. Alukal. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Dr. Kamal just said. Um, I, you know, I, I think that last point, that, that just because we don't have a treatment and just because we think this condition disproportionately burdens uh, certain populations does not mean that we have to rush to provide any treatment in those populations. We may be doing harm uh, as opposed to good, uh, even though our intentions are good. And so I, I think doing the necessary study to get us some answers about this particular intervention, that's, I, I think, absolutely in agreement by everyone. We've all stated that in different ways. And I think even with the, the drug not on the market, without an indication, that study can be performed, and I hope it will be performed. I, I, I really hope um, COVID, uh, as a sponsor, continues to, to participate in that effort 
uh, and enrollment may be easier than everybody um, uh, believes at first glance, again, because there appear to be no other options. So, you know, we then this problem will persist. So we hopefully we'll be able to accrue patients uh, rapidly and, and get some answers. I, I think that the second part of the question that's up there, obviously a, a you know, prospective blinded controlled trial in a high-risk population would be one part of this. And I think the other in parallel should be an observational cohort study of uh, infants born after treatment of the mother uh, with Makina. And I was curious about that, again, not knowing um, a lot about both the clinical condition and the drug. It appears the drug, um, you know, is available overseas uh, under a different name, and it made me curious as to whether or not there's any published data on safety with regard uh, to, um, to newborns um, and then any follow-up of those newborns uh, in, in, you know, database studies from overseas, uh, national health registries. Uh, there doesn't appear to be, although that's my cursory literary uh, cursory lit search. So, I mean, that also represents a, a potential um, for further research. Uh, but obviously, that's going to be a longer term study, and will will take more time unless you were to to simply analyze whatever retrospective data exists. Uh, but I, I, a hugely important question, and I echo um, everyone's thanks for all the people who've come forth and shared their own experiences with this, um, obviously an incredibly difficult clinical question, uh, and hopefully we can find a way through to getting uh, some much-needed answers as soon as is possible. Thank you. Dr. Cowie? Hi, hi, this is Aaron Coy. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I uh, would strongly agree with what Dr. Kaimal said and uh, was really impressed by her uh, her commentary. I worked with Dr. Kaimal in the past, and um, she clearly has superseded anything I would have to say. I guess the one thing I might add in this setting was that um, while I did think that there might be a case to be made to uh, you know consider approval of this medication for some really high-risk group, um, that case was not made from an evidentiary standpoint, and so I don't see how I could vote to approve and continue in the market. Um, I really appreciate that it's an incredibly important area, uh, one of great impact to patients, and I really like the frame that Dr. Kaimal said of, like, that feeling of desperation um, is one that we, we that is important, but we do have other tools, and the idea that we will leave women to just prescribing, going back to prescribing bed rest, I think is not a fair characterization of where the field is at the moment. We do have other things we can do um, at this moment in time in terms of following these patients clinically. Um, we do certainly need medications, and, um, and this medication may be a benefit in the highest risk populations, and such studies need to be conducted uh, to elucidate uh, the populations of which benefit will be affected. So I'll leave it there. That'll be my last comment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Eisenberg? I voted no, uh, uh, but I still am uh, very conflicted because this is a very, very difficult um, question. Uh, I don't feel that we have uh, that, I don't re feel that the studies to date have uh, demonstrated absolute effectiveness, but have, they have also not demonstrated ineffectiveness depending on one, the population. Uh, and I think that the difficulty is identifying the population that would benefit. Um, I, uh, I, just, uh, I um, took to heart Dr. Stein's comments. Uh, and uh, yet, on the other hand, I, I do pose the question, at what point, you know, when, what, at what point do you re, uh, remove the accelerated approval um, if that secondary study, I mean, are you allowed to do another study to, to try to identify the benefit if the study that was done was flawed? That is really uh, a question I have. Um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, I definitely encourage 
uh, additional uh, study, uh, an additional study to be done. Uh, probably uh, not only a randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial, um, but if uh, what the last speaker just said, there are other treatments, then I would recommend a comparative effect in this trial because it would be much easier to recruit uh, for that type of trial. Um, uh, and uh, uh, basically, I, I, this is just a really very difficult question. Uh, it's a difficult problem, and uh, I think we all wish we had solutions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg? Um, Susan Ellenberg, I voted no uh, for uh, the reasons that I stated before. I would also be supportive of studies that um, follow up on um, some of the hypotheses that were generated in the prior studies. Ideally, uh, such a study would be able to identify uh, uh, an effect on neonatal morbidity and mortality, which I think is the ultimate goal of uh, preventing preterm pregnancy. Uh, that would require a, a larger and longer study, I understand, but that that is really what we are interested in here. But um, for the reasons uh, that I said uh, before and which other members of the committee have uh, have also uh, have also stated, I do not favor leaving this on the market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ellis? I voted no. Um, if I had the opportunity to vote with my heart, it might have been yes, but I had to vote with my head and stay within the guardrails of the question and what I know to be true, um, you know, on the regulatory side. So, um, that's why I had to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gass? I think Dr. Gass, you have your phone muted. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I voted no because uh, if we uh, allow that uh, McKenna remain on the market, it implies that the FDA looked at a large study, found no benefit, and yet allowed this drug to stay on the market. I think that's a bad precedent. So I do hope to encourage COVID to continue their work quickly and uh, come up with a new study so we have something to look forward to. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Harper? Thank you, Lori Harper. I voted no. I would just echo what Dr. Kaimal said. I think she really said it very clearly. But I think that the fact that we believe that we have equipoise to further study this medication in a high-risk population to determine its effect um, leads me to believe that there's not currently enough evidence to leave it on the market to state that it's efficacious. So that's why I voted no. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Henderson? Thank you. I, I voted uh, yes, and, and it goes along with my vote for question two. Um, I think the, the trial with the highest risk group um, in the MIS um, demonstrated that there is some signals of effectiveness. I think the second trial did not uh, include a high risk group, although there, the percentage of black population was um, pretty similar. I think, as I discussed the other day, that I think that race in the U.S. is, is really a surrogate for uh, the structural um, indeterminates, the structural determinants of health that we talked about during the meeting. And I think that hasn't been done in the second trial. Um, and I think taking it off the market will, um, again, just ratchet up the uh, compounding pharmacies. And I think then we're in a, in a condition where uh, fetuses are being exposed to uh, substances that we don't understand, we don't know, we don't know what's in them. There's uh, no GMC uh, in those uh, products. And so I, I'm concerned about what women will then be subjected to getting to uh, getting uh, injected with if the McKenna is not available. Um, so I voted yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Huda? Well, again, I voted, I voted no. Um, I think the information presented by both sides was very compelling. I, I 
really appreciate uh, Dr. Kamal and Ms. Ellis's relating their personal experiences, and I, I will say that, um, you know, as physicians, you know, as a physician who deals with this vulnerable patient, this vulnerable population of mothers who deliver preterm babies, you know, on a daily basis, it's a very, very challenging emotional um, journey that both, you know, the parents and the um, uh, professionals who are treating these babies and families go through. So I very much empathize with this, um, you know, this internal debate that we conduct all the time between our heart and our and our mind. And um, it is difficult. Um, I'm sometimes called a therapeutic nihilist, but I like to sort of um, say that rather than being a nihilist, uh, I like to ground my approach in evidence. And, um, you know, looking at the evidence here and looking at the regulatory structure and looking at the potential to create, as I said, bad precedent and regulatory chaos, I think that we have to um, recommend that this product be taken off the market. In my view, that will only facilitate you know, the very much needed further study in the subpopulations of interest. Um, I further comment that I don't think that the 003 trial was flawed. I think it was very carefully constructed. It was similar to the design of 002. Um, it was a much larger trial. And, um, you know, uh, the 87 patients uh, in the sub-analysis of the 1,700 patients in the trial on which there's a signal of efficacy, you know, very much is, is, is intriguing and um, in need of being pursued in, uh, you know, further rigorous studies, as I said, with endpoints that are accepted and that are um, uh, likely to show um, efficacy um, in a very meaningful way um, in the fewest number of patients uh, possible. So, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Dr. Lindsay? I voted no based on the totality of the uh, evidence, but as I said earlier, I would encourage uh, additional uh, clinical trials. I would encourage, I mean, would encourage both the sponsor and the FDA to use the information that they learned from the MEES trial and the PROLONG trial to come up with a trial that will ad address some of the limitations that were pointed out in the uh, trials and also include uh, the expertise from our academic uh, community uh, across the, the U.S. Um, th those are my comments. Thank you. Dr. McAdams DeMarco? Hi, this is Dr. Mayor McAdams DeMarco, and I voted no uh, for a lot of the reasons that have already previously been stated. Um, I would, however, make two suggestions to the sponsor. I would first encourage them to use not only the randomized control trial data, but also pharmacopoeia studies to help identify a truly high-risk population that you expect to have a differential response to the drug, and this would be based on biologic traits. I think this is an important ground uh, ground level uh, stage to informing the design of your subsequent RCT. I would also encourage the sponsor to work, to work with the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at the FDA to design a high quality retrospective cohort study to investigate the risk of intergenerational outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Munn? Hey, this is Dr. Munn, and I voted no as well. Um, you know, this, like uh, for many others, was very difficult for me. Um, you know, I, I live and work in Alabama, and I take care of some of those highest at, at, at risk for preterm birth. So this was, was very, very difficult. Um, I do think that our patients deserve an answer, and I think that, that they deserve that well-designed clinical trial, and I think that 
taking the drug off the market is going to allow that. And I think our patients are amazing and wonderful, and they'll be willing to participate in, in something going forward. So um, I look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Obershon. Thank you. Like others have echoed, uh, this is Sarah Obichan, sorry, University of South Florida Maternal Fetal Medicine. As others have echoed, I have uh, had a difficult time making this decision. It was certainly heavy, but I voted no. And the difficulty comes in how our patients are going to see this and also from my obstetric colleagues. We desperately want a good treatment modality for this overwhelming disease, and it's frustrating that at this time, the evidence and the subsequent sub-analyses have not shown um, effectiveness, um, and that's, that's difficult certainly to bear. Certainly, I would also support another trial to be done in the populations with an appropriate discussion of risk and benefits for those patients, um, but at this time, given the evidence that we have, uh, my vote was no. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shields? Yeah, hi. Um, I voted no as well. Um, and it's been an excellent discussion of the pros and cons of this uh, decision. There's so many elements at play. Um, I uh, voted no because uh, for, for all of the reasons cited by my colleagues, um, I, I disagree with the sponsor that the uh, routine that would need to stay on the market in order for them to do um, a clinical trial. Um, I actually believe the opposite, that they would, women with high-risk pregnancies would be more likely to um, participate if that's, or if, if that's the only way they can get the drug. I, I don't think that would um, prevent them from enrolling. Um, I think that uh, FDA needs to follow the expedited approval rules that have been set out and um, require a confirmatory study in order for the, the product to stay on the market. I think that's really important. I'm afraid that if it remains on the market, it will be used by women for whom there is no um, confirmation of efficacy and we'd be exposing them to harm, both known side effects and um, potential side effects. Uh, particularly to the baby. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think it's um, for the, the FDA to keep the, a product on the market in order to assist the sponsor to um, conduct the study that could be conducted with the, the product off the market. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes polling the advisory committee members. I'm just going to summarize the vote was 14 votes uh, no, one vote yes. So there wasn't co consensus about everything. Um, I think in the j sense of the discussion, though, is that there's clearly a need for uh, treatment for these patients. And also Im important, it will be important to identify who would actually benefit. Um, and, but risk benefit needs to be there in order for this to be available for treatment. Uh, there was general agreement, at least from most of the comments, that the ability to do a study would be um, improved by, the, the, or not improved by the product staying on the market. There were also some concerns raised about compounding and what the effect of withdrawal, market withdrawal could be. Um, and there were some comments about specifically what might need to be done in further studies to identify subpopulation, as well as a comment about looking at epidemiolog epidemiological studies to examine the question about intergenerational um, safety effects, potential effects of the product. So this concludes our discussion. Um, I'll just say in closing, these are really difficult and challenging issues that we've been discussing over the last couple of days. There's obviously a real clinical need for these, you know, for treatment for these patients. As I noted in my opening statement, the vote is not going to decide the issues. Uh, the discussions at this hearing, including the votes and your comments before and after the votes, will be reviewed by FDA before a final decision is issued. 
I really would like to thank everyone who participated in this hearing, the advisory committee, the uh, sponsor, the CEDAR participants, uh, the commissioner's team that has helped with the logistics behind the scene, uh, and everyone else who has 